Okay, so I'm going to tell you about um, work that's been done by three of us from the University of Colorado. I was at the School of Medicine along with Trevor Williams and David Cluthier, who are in the Department of um, Dentistry. I was in pediatrics, and uh, about two years ago, I moved up to University of Colorado Boulder. But this has been a project that's really, I'm going to be telling you a couple of little stories, and we've kind of fallen more on the side of wanting to go with our interests in embryonic development and then find new genes and identify how those genes act to regulate, in this case, neural crest development and neural tube closure. And um, so it's a bit different. We are kind of putting on our science hat and um, just trying to understand how, how these processes are, are uh, evolve. And Trevor Williams was more interested in cranial facial development, David Cluthier in heart development and their neural crest drive, and I'm, I'm interested in the neural tube and early neural progenitor cells. So I'm going to tell you just a few little stories. I'm going to start with a story from uh, Trevor's lab. Uh, this is a published story that he did along with Eric Van Adelou in his, in his lab. And originally, Again, we were all interested in these embryonic processes, and so I was doing forward genetic screens uh, with ENU mutagenesis, and that's how we originally identified this line. But what was really helpful was to be able to get one of the comp knockout lines and be able to um, use that as a conditional allele in order to try to better understand how this gene MIMO, uh, MIMO1 is acting. And so um, now using the, the comp allele for this, we can see that there's uh, craniofacial defects, and I don't, there's, I don't really see a pointer, but um, there's cleft palate, and then there's also some head defects that occur. And so if you do skeletal staining on that, then you can see that there's problems in the um, cranial base here, and then also you can see the cleft palate and how there's uh, problems with the skull forming in this region. And so then Trevor's lab went on and did RNA-seq, and that was really informative in indicating that actually the cells do progress and they start to undergo chondrogenesis, but they don't make the transition to forming bone. And so um, they dissected these regions and did RNA-seq from that, and what you can see is that there's a large number of genes that are reduced in expression that are re reflective of kind of this later osteoblast and uh, metal uh, ECM degradation, as well as then an increase in genes that are more similar to being in, um, actually at a chondrogenic stage. So again, this kind of stall between the two. And then using the LAXC um, knock-in to be able to look at where the gene's expressed, you can see that it's expressed in all of these craniofacial bones, um, including in the region that's uh, most disrupted. And so again, the the the, um, the comp alleles allowed them to be able to do conditional mutants, and so they used a number of different uh, drivers to knock out the function of MIMO in specific tissues. And so when they used a uh, neural crest-derived um, went one Cree um, to, to knock out MIMA function in the neural crest cells, you can see that, again, there's this problem within these um, bones indicating that it's a cell autonomous defect to the neural crest-derived structures. And they went on to um, a study a number of other Cree drivers to try to delve more deeply into this, and so they used ones that were for the chondroblast stage or the osteoblast stage, and as well as one that's um, more expressed within the vasculature. And perhaps surprisingly, you can see that the one, the Cree that drives, that would knock out MIMO expression within the vasculature has the, most, the strongest defect, indicating that MIMO function is required in the vasculature in order to allow these cells to ossify. And then uh, another um, aspect that Trevor's lab did was they also um, changed the genetic background. So they wanted to see how much genetic background would alter the phenotype. And so when they took this from um, originally the C57 black 6 background and then crossed it on to 129 um, SVJ background, they found that they, it's caused an earlier embryonic lethality and again kind of highlights the problem that's occurring within the vascular system and the role of MIMO in vascular function. And I just want to highlight um, Eric Van Otterloo has um, 
was trained in, as a postdoc in Trevor's lab and did a lot of this work with the, the comp alleles. And he's now taken this forward to his own lab at the University of Iowa, um, including some looking now at uh, some of the roles of MIMO in other tissues, including in this case, uh, the teeth. So I then kind of wanted to transition just a little bit and tell you about some of the challenges that we've also found, all three of us have found, um, in getting uh, the knockout lines and uh, trying to study those further. So my, for all of us, we've found that sometimes we'll get the het lines in and we are trying to you know, generate het animals to be able to look at the homozygous phenotype. Oftentimes they'll be poor breeders and so you, know, you kind of really struggle in order to be able to get the line going and be able to do the characterization that we want to do. Another thing that was, um, has been highlighted from the, the COMP2 projects as well is that there can be incomplete penetrance and incomplete expressivity. So for instance, um, you know, I've got, I've, I've become, when you're working on a, a gene that you have no idea what its function may be, you're trying to understand the role in, in these particular tissues. If you only have, let's say in the case of a neural tube defect, if you only have like a 20% or a 30% uh, penetrant phenotype, it makes it really pretty difficult to go from an unknown gene and to try to understand the function of that protein. And so that's also, I'd say, probably made us a little bit hesitant with some of the lines have really nice phenotypes, but again, it can be at such a low penetrance that it just makes it hard for us to study. Um, and then in particular for uh, David and, and Trevor, for a lot of these things to be able to do bone and cartilage staining, you need to have the embryos grow long enough, at least to E14 and a half or 16 and a half, and oftentimes they die prior to that. And so, again, it makes it difficult to tr characterize the phenotype when they're not they're failing to failing to survive. Um, so I just kind of highlighted. I'm going to be telling you about the stories that we've been doing in just a minute about looking at neural tube defects lines. Um, but these, this set of lines here, ultimately, we imported, but we just because of the challenges that I just talked about, we're really never able to kind of pursue those further, and so we don't really understand their function in neural tube closure. And then this is a set of lines that Trevor Williams' lab is still working on, but again, it's been slow and kind of getting to the point of being able to characterize it in terms of their craniofacial and other neural crust uh, phenotypes. And so I don't have any data to show on that. I wanted to show a little bit, just to again highlight some of the uh, struggles that David Cluthier's lab has had as well um, in terms of this incomplete expressivity, and so um, this was just a line that he had imported, this L LG, LG, L L LG1, L I'm not sure, LGL4, um, and so it had been originally characterized to have a shortened lower jaw, and, um, and when they continued to study that using both Lexi expression as well as then characterizing the phenotype of the, the knockout embryos, they weren't able to recapitulate, at least at any um, high enough level, those phenotypes in the craniofacial structures are, are in the heart. And so he discontinued that line. And um, here's another one that David's lab looked at, ATP11A. And um, it looks really quite nice, but again, because of kind of the low penetrance of the phenotype, again, made it a bit of a struggle to study. So by lack C expression, it, um, it's expressed in the heart nicely as well as in the interventricular septum. And um, th the work by um, the DMDD group had uh, done some really nice HRM, HREM uh, analysis and had found that there was this uh, ventricle, ventricle septal defect and thinning of the heart myocardium. And so he was really interested in this. We, he got the allele in order to be able to make a conditional and then be able to knock it out. And so he knocked it out with NKX 2.5, which um, is, is a Cree that will then drive expression in the myocardium and the secondary heart field. Um, and in that case, they saw a hypertrophy of the, vent uh, the heart muscle. Um, but again, at a relatively low penetrance, it made it difficult to kind of continue with that. And again, he was interested in the neural crest-derived 
um, aspects of this um, was thinking that the that this could be responsible responsible for the ventricular septal defect. And so he knocked it out um, again with Wintwin Cree to knock it out in the neural crest, but he failed to see a phenotype in those embryos. So I wanted to move on and tell you about some of the work that we've done um, to try to understand the process of neural tube defects. So I would say, first of all, it's really obvious if there is a neural tube defect, it's a really obvious phenotype. The head's kind of blown open or they have spina bifida. And so I'll tell you um, three little stories about animals that we've been working on to try to characterize the function of um, genes that hadn't been previously identified to be involved in neural tube closure. And so um, SNCC3 uh, came from uh, Steve Murray and Jackson Labs, and so they had some really nice uh, micro CT, that, which was not shown here, but um, showing the exencephaly or the cranial neural tube defect. If we trace that back, we can see even at like E8.25, we can already see defects in these, in these embryos. And SNCC3 is a sorting nexin gene. Um, it falls within a family, but it's really quite different than all the other ones. And it's thought to be involved in the early endosome. So really, we didn't know much about what SNCC3 did, not, certainly not in um, mammals, but in flies and in worms, it had been found to regulate um, the trafficking of wintless which is a receptor that binds the Wnt ligand and helps to, um, so SNCC3 is thought to bring that Wnt receptor back into the cell so that it can then go back in, um, into the ER or the Golgi, pick up Wnt again and be able to secrete that. And so that was um, Heather Brown's first uh, hypothesis that it's involved in recycling of wintless so that you can get this cycle and increase wint signaling, which we know is really important in neural tube closure. And so that's indeed what she's found. She's found that it's involved in both canonical and non-canonical wint signaling. So this is just looking at the expression of, of some genes that are uh, markers of wint signaling, so LEF1. Um, here, um, you can see that it's greatly reduced in, in these mutant embryos, the SNCC3 knockout embryos. And you can also recognize that these little mutant embryos are short and squat, which is reflection of another problem with Wnt signaling that's required for convergent extension to allow the cells to kind of integrate, to extend the embryonic axis and, and bring the neural folds close to one another. And so these also then have a convergent extension defect. And so we always try to kind of move back and forth between the mouse embryos and in vitro systems if we can. And so since the idea was that maybe SNCC3 is binding wintless and recycling that from the membrane um, back to the early endosome and back to pick up more wint and continue the strong signaling, essentially without going into the data, that's what she found is that in wild type, um, SNCC3 and wintless co-localize within the early endosome. Um, and, but when there's a mutation in SNCC3, this endocytic recycling is, is disrupted and instead the wintless goes to the lysosome and gets degraded and she can rescue that phenotype. So another angle that we've taken, um, all three little stories that I'll tell you about, is that we also are interested in how we can take what we're learning in the mouse embryo and be able to try to understand um, human development. And so um, we've established a nice relationship with Hope Northrup and Paul Ah in, at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston, where they've sequenced a number of um, uh, patients that have uh, spina bifida or myelomeningocele. Um, and done whole exome sequencing. And so in this case, they found a mutation in SNCC3. It ends up that the mouse SNCC3 and the human SNCC3 are 100% conserved across the whole domain. And so we can just create this patient-specific point mutation, put it back into our in vitro assays to test the functionality. Because one of the big problems that we find with trying to um, understand any of the human genetic data is how causative is the, that point mutation that you may find in um, the actual phenotype that we see. So we're going to model this one. Okay, so 
Moving on to a different mutant um, that we got from Baylor University and Mary Dickinson's group is um, a mutation in TMEM132A. So these animals, this is the um, micro CT work that came from the Baylor group, and so you can see that they have spina bifida, which is here in this caudal part of the neural tube. Um, they have heart defects, and they also have limb defects. So you start out again with you know, TMEM132A, all it stands for is transmembrane protein 132A, and so like where do you go from there? And so um, what Ben Ben Lee in my lab did was um, mass spec analysis to try to, under, try to identify interacting proteins with this transmembrane, it's a single pass transmembrane protein to try to understand how it's working. And surprisingly, the, one of the biggest hits we had took us back to Wintless, which takes us back to that SNCC3 um, story that I just told you about. And so the three major pathways that he found, uh, again, relate to Wnt signaling and to cell adhesion. So he found that it interacts strongly with Wintless, um, also beta-catenin, which is part of the Wnt signaling pathway, as well as um, many of the cadherins and catenins that are involved in cell adhesion. So where do we go from there? Um, he's been doing a lot of biochemistry with this, but essentially just showing you just a few little bits of information. Again, this unknown transmembrane protein positively regulates the secretion of Wnt, and I'll come back to give you a little model in a minute, but essentially in the homozygous um, uh, cells, there's less Wnt that gets secreted into the media, and we can do like a co-culture to see um, when, whether Wnt signaling is occurring, and that's disrupted, which is also shown by disruption of um, genes that are downstream of Wnt. And the other piece of data that he was just showing me yesterday, so I don't have to show you, but he's also found that um, this transmembrane protein <coughs> also perhaps is like a chaperone or somehow in complex, uh, really greatly increases the interaction between Wintless and the Wnt ligand. And so this transmembrane protein perhaps is this kind of trimolecular structure increases those interactions. So to kind of circle back between the SNCC3 and the Wintless um, and, the, and the transmembrane TMEM132A, we think that uh, the transmembrane protein is expressed here in the Golgi, where it interacts with Wnt-less to pick up Wnt in order to secrete this through vesicles out to the surface of the cell. And then the SNCC3 acts to bring the Wnt-less receptor back into the cell in order to be able to recycle this and allow signaling to continue. So just to give you a little, so it's complicated, <laughs> you know, all of these genes and proteins probably act in multiple pathways. So our first kind of ha favorite hypothesis, um, there's some really kind of interesting work that's come out that really started from uh, working with uh, embryonic or um, iPS cells and trying to generate uh, neural tissue and found that much of the spinal cord is generated from a kind of a dual progenitor population that are called neuromesodermal progenitors. And depending on the level of FGF and Wnt signaling, these cells can either pick a mesodermal fate or pick a, a neural fate. And um, our, we had done RNA-seq analysis and again it highlighted that there was problems with Wnt signaling. And it also showed that there was less mesodermal uh, markers that were expressed. So we really thought that we might be sitting at this border and that this might be a regulator, uh, this transmembrane protein might be a regulator of, of this bipotential choice between neural or mesoderm. But it don't, it's probably not, that's probably part of the story, but I think that's probably a subset of the story. And um, so we're still kind of trying to figure this one out, but we also do see that CDX, which is a, another important regulator downstream of this pathway that's needed to keep the tail growing and to give um, anterior posterior identity, that we see these CDX genes get dysregulated in the mutant. Um, so we're 
kind of um, getting close to kind of finish off a small story on that, but now we've kind of gone back to thinking that a lot of the spina bifida may also be involved through changes in cell adhesion and this transmembrane protein in regulating uh, the adhesion of these cells within the spinal region, and if that doesn't occur properly, then you can get a, a spina bifida. And again, taking this um, to the human side, there's multiple mutations within this transmembrane protein in um, humans with uh, myelomeningocele or spina bifida. So again, we have these nice in vitro assays that we can create these patient-specific mutations and then look at the functionality of this transmembrane protein um, with, with these functional mutations. And I'll just end up on one last story, because we're also interested in kind of neural progenitor um, uh, proliferation and differentiation. And if that balance gets disrupted, this can give rise to microcephaly or where the brain is too small. And so this is another allele that came from, um, or another gene knockout that came from the Baylor group. So this is ACTAR5. So you can see, obviously, the mutant embryos are much smaller than the wild type here at E9 and a half. Um, and they have clearly uh, major head problems in the, in the neuroprogenitor cells within the head. So again, we don't know much about what ACTAR5 does. Um, there's work in yeast that indicates that it can do a number of things also through the INO80 complex. Um, but some of the things it's involved in is the regulation of DNA damage and DNA repair and chromatin remodeling. And so we, because we only imported this line not too long ago. So again, we try to play back and forth between cell culture work and the embryo in order to better inform uh, both studies. And so we've been doing some cell lines while we're waiting for the, the line to get up so that we can start to analyze the embryos. We've been doing some cell line work um, using neural progenitor cells and do find that indeed the sector 5 in mammalian cells needs to, is involved in DNA repair and um, DNA damage response. So we see when we knock it down with siRNAs, um, we see that there's an increase in phosphate H2AX, which is a marker of DNA damage. There's an increase in P53, another marker of DNA damage, and there's activation of caspase. Um, we also see that there's changes in, in um, the, how the chromosomes segregate and cell survival in these, in these cells. And so we're really looking forward to having some tissue from the embryo because we think that's going to be a large part of the problem and why we get microcephaly and loss of these neural progenitor cells. And this has been done by um, Luisa uh, Gayazo Miranda in my lab. And again, um, there's mutations, multiple mutations in ACTAR5 that are also find, found in the human patient samples. So uh, again, we've got the cell-based assays that we can test functionality. And so with that, I'd really like to thank um, the COMP2 project. It's been a lot of fun. Um, in particular, I want to thank uh, Mary Dickinson and the whole Baylor group. Um, we've gotten a number of reagents from them. Also, Steve Murray and the Jackson Labs, and UC Davis has also been really helpful in sending us animals. Thanks. The memo one story is really cool. Um, so the Thai Tukri should knock out the vasculature as well as some hematopoietic cells. Mm -hmm. So is it, do you know anything more about whether they've teased that apart because? I don't think so. I don't know if, uh, if Eric is gonna continue with that um, in his group, so. Yeah. Yeah, is there a really good Cree to be able to tease Yeah, there it are some good ones that you can like use. One so there's be? a well, there's a Runx one, and there's um, another I've, that's escaping me. But uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't know. The, the other question that I had that I would love to get with you on is when you talk about the penetrance things. Um, how are these reflected in the numbers? So we have, you know, we've 
obviously we see variable ex expressivity when we first take the lines. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see if they're really statistically different. Now we have a small capture, yeah. but um, if there's really a lot of variation compared to when they go out to you or not. I don't think it's probably that big. I mean, you guys have definitely seen that variability as well. I think um, at the very beginning, we were just like, we were so anxious to get reagents in. It's yeah. like, we don't care, we'll take it. And then when you really start to delve into it, again, with a novel <coughs> gene, then you realize it's just really tough to do it if it's mm -hmm. a lower mm -hmm. penetrance. So I must say, sure. I've, I've been more hesitant for getting um, neural tube defect lines if they're like, you know, 20% penetrant, because mm -hmm. I just know that it's going to have to just be so much sure, reading sure. to do. And really, you want to look at the phenotype before it presents, um, yeah. and but then you don't know which is going to be the ones sure. that might have the phenotype. We just want to make sure that we're that we have the I data out the, there so you can make those choices. Yeah, I mean, as you say, the the number that you analyze is relatively small. So right. obviously, we have a lot more numbers. But I would say it's not it's not really that different. I mean, we did know that there would be okay. incomplete penetrance. Okay. Can you to, use the uh, mic, Rob, please? Be, be great to know if uh, there's a heterozygous adult phenotype for the team m 132 a It's a very good candidate gene for total brain weight in mice. It's one, one, one of the highest QTLs. Uh, so is there any, any kind of adult phenotypes for the HETs? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, because there was some really nice HET screening that were done with all, all these lines first. Uh, um, at least it's not obvious to us. I mean, we're, we're dependent on having viable, fertile, het animals in order to be able to continue with our homozygous screen. Um, and so I don't remember for any of these that they have a het phenotype. The only one that we've seen, I, I did get an addendum um, to add on to the Comp2 from the um, I forget which group, but the dietary supplement group, because we've been doing a lot of work on folic acid. And um, so we found that actually with the SNCs3, we can see then a HET phenotype in embryos um, based on the level of folic acid that we add. But, um, but overall, I, I think the animals are pr pretty fine as HETs. Which, you know, is not to say there's not a brain phenotype, but they can eat and they can breed, right? <laughs> We're not putting them through any other behavioral tests than that. <laughs>